Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also thank you to the ranking member for having this important hearing. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a devastating toll and highlighted the ugly reality of health disparities in our country. Um, it is our responsibility to learn the, from these lessons that COVID-19 forced us to confront. Otherwise, people are gonna suffer systemic disparities over and over again. And this lens extends to our research infrastructure as well. Dr. Tabak, you note in your testimony that the impacts of the pandemic have not been felt equally across American communities with black and Latino and other underserved communities, as well as care practitioners and others on the front lines bearing the brunt of both the physical and mental health impacts of COVID-19. How have these lessons about health inequity informed the approach to our research infrastructure, and how are you ensuring our clinical trials include people from traditionally underrepresented communities and those with traditionally underrepresented lived, lived experiences as we look at the long-term physical and mental health impacts of COVID-19? What we've learned is we have to proceed at the speed of trust in order to engage people from what are very often marginalized communities. Um, we have to reach out um, often through trusted advisors, community leaders, to build the basis of, of why the research that we are proposing to conduct is important. We're also working very hard to recruit a much more diverse workforce. Um, when somebody looks like you, it, it, it is easier to, to engage um, in, in what are very important and serious discussions. Um, we, during the, during the COVID response, we, we have um, had specific programs. For example, the, the RADx Underserved Populations Program, where we reached out to communities to understand why there wasn't an uptake in, in some of the over-the-counter um, testing procedures. Um, and so we, we are using a broad range of, of approaches. Uh, within NIH, of course, um, all of our research is being informed by these lessons. Uh, certainly not just that restricted to COVID. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I also want to pivot to discuss future management and communications during public health emergencies. So, uh, Dr. Walensky, uh, it's great to see you again, and, and thank you so much for, for all the wonderful work that you do and, and also being one of the facing forward individuals that Americans uh, hear from. So thank you for all the wonderful work you've been doing. Uh, you talk a bit in your testimony about the importance of translating science into practical, easy to understand policy. You came to my office and I actually understood what you were explaining to me, so thank you. I, I'm not a doctor like, like some of my colleagues are. Uh, <laughs> in districts like mine, uh, where the majority of households report speaking Spanish at home uh, as their primary shared language, it's absolutely critical to make sure we have health resources in Spanish and in, in, in other languages in our great country. How are you uh, looking to improve health messaging across many languages? And what challenges have you seen in your attempts to combat COVID uh, and misinformation in non-English languages? Uh, we have a big problem in the Spanish-speaking community when it comes to uh, what people see on the internet and the, the misinformation and disinformation. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's been critically important for us to bridge the equity divide that we have seen in this country through COVID-19. Um, so much of what we've done, our, many of our guidances are not just available in Spanish, but in dozens of languages, actually, and it's critically important. But yet, we still have people who may not be able to access those guidances, either a digital divide, a literacy divide, many other reasons, um, and, and even in, uh, uh, um, yeah, many other reasons. So, you know, much of our work has been in how we we reach people? Is it through um, community health workers? Is it through uh, community-based organizations? Um, much of our divide we've seen has been in the rural-urban divide. So what we really, 46 million are rural Americans who were, you know, have half the vaccination rates in their pediatric populations. So we really need to reach people where they are. The mis- and disinformation often reaches them faster. And that is really a critically important to emphasize we all have a role because we at CDC will do a lot of work to try and tackle that. But it may not be the government official that they want to hear from. It may be an academic society. It may be an academic official. It may be 
you know, somebody in their local pharmacy, it may be their local pediatrician. Um, so we have met much work to do in the mis and disinformation, and I would urge again, all of us have a role in addressing mis and disinformation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time having expired, I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Neal.